I'm not sure if you realize it or not, uh, but there are stories of generosity all over the place. A matter of fact, a couple of years ago, there was a lady who went by one of the Salvation Army drop boxes, say you would see outside of Walmart or uh, other places, and she dropped in it uh, a wedding ring from her late husband that had passed away. And uh, that ring was a gold ring and approximate value of almost $2,000, about $1,850 exactly. And she put a little note on it and she said, I hope and I pray that someone who has made far more money this year could buy this wedding ring for 10 times its worth so it'd be a benefit to others. One lady out of Massachusetts actually picked up this story and she's a widower herself and she decided that she would buy that ring for $22,000 and she did it so that the ring could re be returned back to its original owner. But the Boston.com uh, said that the original owner never came forward to accept the ring. Uh, there was another uh, guy um, that was here in Texas and... Um, he actually went in uh, to a Chicken Express store, and he went in that day after having a long day shopping for his family, and uh, he bought a, a regular meal with a handful of tenders and fries and a drink, and uh, surely he swipes his card, and it won't go through, and it declined, and they swiped it again. Y'all ever been there before, you know? Yes, and uh, you know the miserable feeling that there is, and he keeps swiping, keeps swiping, keeps swiping. And finally, there's a young man that working in the back, he brought his card and he said, hey, why don't you let me swipe it? And the young man in the back swiped the card and bought his meal and said, I hope you have a blessed day. Well, later, this gentleman in Texas came back and he actually brought all his family and friends together and he even was able to figure out who the parents of the young man was. And he gave him 10 times what the value was that he paid for that day. Isn't generosity something that we feel inspired by? I mean, it's something that we know that it's, it's something that feels good. It's something that we should do. Proverbs 24, 11 says, the generous man prospers and he who refreshes others, he himself will be refreshed. Like there's just something about a life-giving generosity that brings warmth to our soul. It's something we know we ought to do. It's something that all of us in this room probably would say we should do better and yet it seems that we get so caught up in our life that we find ourselves not giving like God created us to give, not giving like we would like to give. And yet we're inspired by other people's stories and we never figure out a way to put ourselves in the position of the giver. And my prayer is today is that as we discover this text, you would know not only what God is giving you, but what he's giving all of us as responsibility to do in being generous. And so I pray that today you leave this service impacted in terms of generosity in a way that you've never been impacted before. And so if you wouldn't mind, whether you're here in Wills Point or joining us on, uh, on the Edgewood campus, I pray uh, that you would join me in prayer. And I, I'm asking something different. Instead of you just listening to my prayer and maybe kind of agreeing, would you just right there in your seat, would you just say, God, would you open my heart today? Would you, would you speak to me in a way that you've never spoken to me and make the prayer not about what I'm saying or praying to God, although we are in agreement there, but make it about what you need God to speak to you on. Okay. So let's join together. God, I pray that you would help us to see the blessing of generosity. Father, I thank you that as we have discovered already in the previous three weeks that Every ounce of generosity we display actually points to a, a true and better giver, someone who laid his life down so that we may have life and have it eternally. And so, Father, I pray that we wouldn't just gather in this place and, and shake our heads in, in agreement saying, oh, yeah, we should give. And yes, we are inspired by generosity. But God, I pray that you would drill a hole in our hearts and you would fill it with a love for other people that we've never really known before. And I pray, God, you would start with me. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to the scriptures, that you would enlighten us to things that we've never seen before, and that we would put them to use. I pray that as we see in James, we wouldn't be like the man who hears the word and so deceives himself. But I pray that we would listen to the word and that we would apply it. Thank you for this time. I pray your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
So if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Now in Matthew 25, Jesus is going to give a handful of parables. <coughs> parables are stories that Jesus would tell oftentimes of the followers that had gathered around. And the point of the parable is not to point out multiple things, but typically there's one truth in there that everyone needs to grab a hold of. And in this particular text, in Matthew chapter 25, he is speaking to a nation called Israel. Now, it's one of about five parables that is really, truly speaking to a nation as a whole, and that nation is Israel. Now, real quickly, let me kind of give you like a two-minute two overview. Israel is God's people. We see that in the Old Testament. He raised up a man named Abraham. He said, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you people, descendants, land, and blessing. He said, I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. I'm going to give you all of those things if you will follow me and you'll become obedient to me. And we know that if you read the Old Testament at all, that there were cycles of obedience and there were many cycles of disobedience. If you don't really know how to understand Israel, it's best to just look at your own life and the patterns that you have with God. You're up and down, you're up and down, you're up and down. Some days you're at God's feet and you're praying, you're like, God, I love you and I love you. I mean, you're the greatest thing in the world. And then other days you're like yelling at your neighbor, you're, you're calling your husband, and your wife, all these different things, and you don't look anything like a believer, only to come back another day and go, God, I'm sorry, I messed up again. That's the nation of Israel. Up and down, up and down. Yet then they hit this, cross, this crossroads, this crisis of belief, as you would call it. And the crisis of belief stemmed from this, this man called Messiah, he would call himself the son of man. He would literally say, I have the power to raise the dead to life. I have the power to make the blind see. I have the power to even forgive sins. And they said, oh, no one can forgive sins but God. And he says, and I and the father are one. I am God. You want to see, you want to see God look at me. And that led them to take him to a sinner's cross where criminals are killed, hang him with other thieves, punish him, stricken him, beat him, mock him, reject him, spit upon him. Just as Isaiah the prophet would say 700 years earlier in Isaiah 53, all of those things would happen so that he would bear your punishment, my punishment, the punishment of the whole world, even the punishment of Israel. Yet here's the deal. Israel rejected him. It wasn't people who didn't love God that killed Jesus. It was people who claimed to love God that killed Jesus. It was the religious emphatics. It was the leaders and the zealots. It was the people who had great zeal for God who led Jesus to Calvary. It was those who claimed to be generous. And yet in Matthew 23, Jesus said, no, 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 no. You're the one who keeps tying up cumbersome loads and you're not willing to carry those loads yourself. It reminds me a lot, again, of some of us church people. Standards that we don't even obtain to, we place on other people. But yet, what, here's what God did. He set Israel aside, and he said, I am rejecting you as my people for a time. Ezekiel 20 maps it out clearly for you. And he says, and I'm going to raise up some other people. I'm going to adopt them. Israel, you were my son. You were clearly mine, and yet I am pushing you aside. I'm going to adopt other people into this story. I'm going to set the first string quarterback on the bench for all you sports fans. I'm going to take that second string. He doesn't look the part, but I'm going to use him. And for a time, he does that. And Ezekiel 20 says, but there's going to be a one day that he'll restore the nation to their proper place. But it's after a time in which the church age, which you and I are in now, where we've taken the gospel out to people, I'll raise them up in the last day. And so we know in the last days that there's going to be a picture of Messiah coming for his church. There's going to be a seven year tribulation period for Israel to put a rod on their back. God's going to discipline them severely for their choices. And then there's going to be a thousand year millennial reign. And then that thousand year millennial reign, he's going to gather his people back, Israel, 
we're already going to be ruling with him and he's going to give us power and dominion and place in, in heaven in which we'll rule alongside with him. But in that thousand years, it's designed to gather his people, Israel, back. And what he wants from them is in this text in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. He wants them to be faithful he wants them to be loving and kind and generous and to display the acts of God in a which way they should have been doing all along. Interesting enough, though, as this is for Israel, it is also very applicable to us in the church age. But in the context of what's going on in the book of Matthew, it's clear that this text is surrounding Israel but we're going to go ahead and use it. We're going to crop some things out of it for you and I in this generosity series. So let's read in verse 14. <clears throat> for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. To one, he gave five talents to another two, to another one, to each according to his own what? Ability. Then he went away. And so the master gathers three servants, three servants in which he clearly knows and understands. And he says, I'm going to give you five. I'm going to give you two. and I'm going to give you one. Now, I want you to understand real quickly that a talent is not an amount of money, but it's a weight of money. And it could be gold. It could be silver. It could be copper. It could be various different things. But if it happens to be gold then what he is giving this man with five talents is millions of dollars. If it happens to be silver, then he's giving him hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if you just took something that was not real important, maybe some copper or something like that, you're literally looking at still anywhere from a value probably of twelve to $20,000 being one talent. So this isn't like, hey, I'm going to give you a handful of dollars as I walk away. Most people would su suggest that one talent uh, could potentially take a man anywhere from 15 to 20 years to gain this amount of money. So we're not talking about chump change. We're not talking about, hey, here's a few dollars and I I'm going to go away for a little while. We're talking about a significant amount of money. And so here's what happens a lot of times as we read the parable of the talents, if, especially if it's not your first time to read it. We look at it and we go, well, wait a second. This doesn't seem fair. Like you're telling me that the, the master is going to, he's going to pick and choose and one he's going to give five and one he's going to give two and one he's going to give one. Well, what, what, what about me? Like, well, God, what are you going to give me? And here's what I want you to understand. The Christian life has never, ever, ever in scriptures been deemed as fair. It wasn't fair that Jesus died on the cross for you to start with. But it's also not fair in the way that God displays anything. Like for some of us in here, our time on earth is different. For some of us, we're going to live into our 30s or 40s. For some of you, you're going to live into your 70s or 80s. For some of you, even though your life is longer than many of your friends, you may experience hardship, health problems, and things that keep you on the edge and on your knees. For some of you, you have great health and you've always maintained that and God's blessed you with that. For some of you, you have great resources. You have money in the bank. You have plenty of things to share. You have nice homes. For others of you, it's month to month and you look up and you go, I don't have near the amount that other people have. And what I want you to understand is that all of us are different. Even when it comes to the church, there are some of us that we're kind of behind the scenes people. Like God's given all of us as Christians spiritual gifts, but they all look different. For some of us, we're kind of behind the scenes. We happen to be the toes. Like there's a shoe on us. We don't want to be seen. For others of us, we're the mouth and we don't hardly ever shut up. And sometimes you're like, please shut up, right? We all have different roles, but listen, God is a portion to each of us, the role. And then he goes away. And he says, but I will be back. So he apportions it and it's not fair. It doesn't have to be fair. And what's interesting is, is that God's not going to judge. And in this picture, the master is not going to come and he's not going to judge these men on what he's given them. Good news. Take a breath. <gasps> awesome. So it doesn't matter if I'm a toe. It doesn't matter if I don't have as much wealth as someone else. It, it doesn't matter if I don't live as long or I don't have as good a health. No. What does matter is what you do with what God has apportioned to you. 
What matters is not the amount of responsibility you have because that's where we get caught up in the church. Well, how in the world did, how in the world did he get to be a deacon? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I'm, I should be a deacon. Well, how in the world did you hire him? Like, how did he get to be full-time? Why am I part-time? Well, how in the world did they get to lead in kids' ministry? I've been here the whole time. And the bottom line is, who cares? If that's where you're finding your worth and your value, then you're looking in the wrong place because God says, I'm not concerned as much about what it is I'm giving you. I'm concerned about what you do with what I give you. And so is this message for everyone? Absolutely it is. Why? Because he's not talking about everyone in here who has some responsibility. He's talking to everyone. Matter of fact, he's saying that everyone in here should have responsibility. Hold on, thank you. Hold on, let me step back real quick. Everyone in here, everyone in this story, everyone in this text has responsibility. Your responsibility may not be as big as someone else's responsibility, but you still have responsibility, and that's what you're going to be managed for. And you go, well, I, I don't, I don't understand this. Well, let me make it more clear to you. As Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, he says, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own, that you've been bought for a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, he's not just talking about your bodies. He's talking about your time, your talent, your treasure, everything you have. He says, honor God with it. Why? Because you were bought with a price and you're not your own. And so as Christians, we need to discover whether or not we are one, walking and abiding in the master. And then number two, are we doing what we agreed that we would do? And that is to deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow Jesus. Or are you still longing to be in control of almost all the resources that God has equipped you with? Because it's very clear in this story who gives and apportions what you have, the master. Understand? In verse 16, it says, And he who received the five talents went out at once. He traded with them. He made the five talents more. So also he had two talents. He made two talents more. He goes, I gave one to five. He went out and he made five more. Also the one who had two, he went out and he made two more. So the bottom line is in, in, in this text is they understood the responsibility and they went to work. Then you look at verse um. 18, but he who received the one talent went and he dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. He did very little. So you have two who they go out and they're, they're faithful to go to work. We don't know how they go to work. (coughs) We don't know exactly what it is that they do. We just know they go to work and we know that they work hard and we know that they have a return that is equal to the amount that was apportioned to them. And then we know one who was lazy and slothful and did nothing And he ultimately just went and he dug a hole in the ground and he put all the money in it. Now, we need to note that this is a significant amount of money that you're putting in the ground. It'll be important as you see the master's response here in just a little while. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and he settled accounts with them. Now, here's the important thing. After a long delay, the master is gone He says, I am going to return, and then eventually he does. This sounds very familiar to Israel, because what Israel needs to know is, is that I am going to return, and we know that there is going to be a reign in which God does return. And we know that he's coming for his people, Israel. Now, what's interesting is, we also know that the scripture says that he's coming for us, the church. And so just as Israel needs to be looking for their master, so does the church need to be looking for their master. And what's important to note in this text is that while we keep our eyes fixed on the author and the perfect of our faith, the Lord Jesus, and his return for us, the church, people who have acknowledged that he is indeed Jesus, Lord, Romans 10, believe in your heart, confess in your mouth, you'd be saved. If that's you, then you need to keep your eyes fixed there. And as you keep your eyes fixed there, you ought to be what? faithful in doing the work in which he has entrusted you knowing that there's going to be a day in which you will see him. Now, I I don't know if you would agree with this statement, but I think many of us, and, and particularly in this story, there was one man in this story who either did not believe that his master was coming or that it would be a longer time off than he had expected. Maybe he thought, well, one day I'm going to go and I'm going to dig that money up and I'm going to do something with it. 
Because I think most of us in this room, we, we would say, yes, I do believe scripture points to Jesus and his return. I think most of us say, would even say something with the audacity that it could potentially be in my lifetime. But yet, if we look at the things that the master's entrusted to us, we're doing very little with the things he's given to us with the expectation of a return, particularly a return that would be coming soon. And the master says, I'm coming back. And these men, they went to work as if it could be soon, with the exception of one. And what does he do? He comes back and he's going to settle what? Accounts with them. And what you're going to see in the following part of this text is that he's going to take them one by one and he's going to speak to them individually. See, you and I oftentimes look for churches that are alive and are doing things. Like a lot of people run into you at the grocery store, like, hey, where do you go to church? Oh, I go to Stone Point. Oh, okay, I've heard good things about Stone Point. Oh, yeah, I mean, we love Stone Point. And you hope that you're going to be judged on the basis of a group of people called the church like Stone Point. The problem is you're not. Oh, man, I've got, I've really, I'm a part of this really strong small group. Awesome. Well, it doesn't matter if everybody in the small group's really strong if you're not strong. Because you're not going to be judged on the basis of how strong your small group, your church is, how great of a Christian man your grandfather was how great of a Christian woman your mother was. You're going to be judged on the basis of what you have done for the master and what he has entrusted to you. Understand? It's a case-by-case -case basis. Not fair, but just. You're not going to be able to look to, to the master in time of your conversation and go, whoa, 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 but, I, but surely I, I still did more than him. Because what he's going to do is he's going to say, like many of our pastors might say to a handful of our people, hey, would you please quit deflecting and let's get back on our conversation and question. I didn't ask you that question. I asked you this question. And it's interesting to see that oftentimes in our conversations, we'll answer every question except the one that was asked. And here's what you need to note. Jesus will have one question. And that will be, what have you done with what I gave you? Why? Well, well, I mean, I did, I did more than him. No, 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 no. I didn't ask what he did. Well, I did more than her. No, no, no. I didn't ask what, her, what she did. I'm asking what you did. You understand the seriousness? That, you're like, man, I think you're on me, Rand. No, no, no. I want you to feel the weight of this text. <laughs> this is not some cute little story. Well, he's given me more than he gave you. No, no, no. There's weight here. The master has left his glory. He has said, I am entrusting it to your care. Do not take this lightly. I am coming back. I will cause you to stand in front of me and I will not deal with you fairly. I will deal with you justly. And I can feel the weight of that. And I think all of us in here would go, yeah, yeah. And all I want is for God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And he may say that, but I want you to know there's still more hanging in the balance than just that statement. Like if you begin to read in Revelation, I want you to understand that there is a Bema judgment for you and I called the church. And that means that he's going to apportion to us gifts, fine linen, white and clean, based off of what we have done. Not based off of our salvation, because we know Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. And so this judgment is not white thrown. You're not going to be thrown into the fire. But what it is, is saying what you have done for me will ultimately land you to position in my kingdom long term. I'm going to place you for what, hey, when you, when, hey, when you have done what, been faithful with little, I will give you much. That's not speaking of just earthly. That's speaking of eternally. We think, oh, if I handle this $5 really well, then God's going to bless me with another 50. No, 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 no. This is eternal. If you're faithful to the things that he's asked you to be faithful with while he's gone away, then eternally he's going to portion you more. Why? Because you've been faithful. That's the point. So look at verse 20. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more. Y'all remember the, the, the show Undercover Boss? I love that show. 
And because what it is, is you've got this guy who, who he leaves his place of authority. He disguises himself and he goes among the little peasants, you know, the cooks, the people cleaning the bathrooms. And inevitably, there's always a handful of people that are so faithful and they treat him like he can't do half the jobs and, and, and that they can do. And you know, at the end of the day, they're about to pull their hair out of the sky because you're like, surely you can learn how to, to cook a basket of fries. Surely you've cleaned a toilet before. And, and there's this frustration, but yet there's always a group of people in undercover boss that handle him gracefully. And they always treat him with respect and dignity. And it's almost as if they, they really care about what they've been entrusted to. That they love the business, that they aspire to greater things, that they, they look forward to maybe potentially staying with the business and, and making moves up the ladder. And then inevitably there's always one or two in the show too that they're just not, I mean, they're just lazy. They're not faithful to anything. They don't care about the company, the company's vision, motto, et cetera. They don't care. They just got a job and it's very clear that I just want you to pay me so I can go home. But don't you love at the end of the show on Undercover Boss, the day of reckoning? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I mean, just the looks as they catch them when the, with the camera as the boss comes in and, and they're all sitting there and they're all kind of wondering, like, what am I doing here? And then he comes in and they're like, oh my goodness. And you can see it all over their face. And, and it's always a little bit worse, though, for those who what? were lazy and slothful and treated him harshly. And do you always see what happens at the end of the show? Like I'm left in tears at every end of the show. And the reason why is because these ones who, they didn't have a whole lot. He just pours out blessings. I mean, he's sending their kids to college. He's like, and I'm going to promote you. I'm going to give you your own franchise. And you're like, oh my gosh. And then the other one, he's like, you know, I'm sorry, but you're fired. <laughs> That's the best illustration I got for you for the rest of this text. <laughs> and he would receive the five talents, came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Verse 22. And he also, who had two talents, came forward saying, Master, you de delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. And he said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. See, they, were, they went promptly. They were persistent. They had great productivity. And because of that, they received praise and a future of a promise, blessing coming. Understand? They went promptly, they were persistent, they were productive, and because of that, they were praised well and they had a promise of future blessing. Five Ps right there. And then look at the 24. And he who had received one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be what? A hard man, reaping where you don't sow, gathering where you don't scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went, and I hid the talent on the ground. Here's what I have is your. And because of his false view of the master, it led him to fear and fruitlessness. His false view of the master led him to fear and fruitlessness. And see, some of us in here, we would say to ourselves, God, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. And so I don't have a whole lot. And God, even if I give it to you, it's not going to make a dent in the kingdom. God, I don't have a lot of time and talents. I mean, I've got a lot of stuff going on. And I really don't, I don't see the importance of some of these things. And so what you are essentially doing is you, we go and we hide it in the ground and because of a false view of the master and his word and his church, it leads us to fear in our lives. But the worst part is fruitlessness. We look at the end of our days and we've done nothing with what God's entrusted to our care. And I wanted you to hear this and I'm going to say this very carefully. If you believe that you can be fruitful, Without walking out the gospel biblically, you are wrong. Now, let me define the gospel biblically. The gospel biblically says, I want you to not forsake the assembling of the saints. I want you to sharpen others as iron sharpens iron, meaning you ought to be in community. You ought to be in a small group. You ought to be walking forward. 
The Bible says that God has apportioned to us gifts, spiritual gifts that we ought to be using for his service in his church. Jesus, every time that he closed a gospel out with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every time in a different way, he says, go therefore, go therefore to all nations, teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand why our, our church mission is set up the way it is. Connect people to God, to others, and service in the world. Why? Because that is biblical. We require all of our church members to do all those things, although about 40% of our church members aren't doing those things. And at the end of this year, you're going to get a letter from us that when you're no longer under the shepherding of our pastors. And it seems harsh, but if you don't want to be pastored, then why are you eating in our green pasture? You know, the hardest thing for me as a pastor is when I get a call from someone who's not in our church, walking out scripturally what they should be doing and they want to be pastored. I'm accountable to you and your souls to God. See, I'm not, I'm not going to be judged based off of whether or not I'm serving in the church or whether or not I am giving to the church or why? Because I'm doing all those things. Why? Because you go, well, that should come natural. You're a pastor. Yes. No, I'm going to judge more harshly than you. Why? Because I'm accountable to God for you. And I want to be accountable to God for people who eat our pasture and drink our water. You understand why I'm saying, like, I'm not saying that to be a jerk. I'm saying, I'm, I want you to know the weight of this text. I want to pastor people who would say, I am committed to this gospel and walking it out. And that's why we continually and persistently talk about small groups and serving in the church and going out and making the gospel known. Why? Because I have, I'm judged for you and how well you do. How do you like those apples? <laughs> but do you understand the weight of it? It's a different weight. And I don't take it lightly. But it drives me crazy when people go, hey, I need 25 minutes with you. Why do you need 25 minutes with, you, with me? You're a holy priesthood. Apparently, you have the great high priest. You don't need me. You need Jesus. Well, no, no, no. I need 25 minutes with you. No, you don't. I don't have a problem meeting with you, but I'll tell you who I'm going to consistently meet with. I'm going to consistently meet with people who are committed to the things I'm committed to. I don't outsource people that are a part of our body and eating our green pasture to other people. I'm not going to outsource our people, our sheep, to a counselor who's professional. Why? Because you don't need professional counseling. You need the gospel. You need God's word, and you need it to richly abide in your hearts. But for those who say, well, I'm going to dig a hole in the ground, and I'm going to just hope that the master, when he returns, he's going to deal with me gently— I just have to tell you that he's not. And so what does he want from you? He wants, listen to this. He wants you to answer. And this is the way the guy answered. But his master answered, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and my coming. I should have received what was my own with interest. He says, you did nothing. You did nothing. You didn't give anything. You didn't serve anywhere. And then he also, I want you to understand, he doesn't want you to be confused that just because you serve somewhere, but you don't give a dime, don't consider yourself faithful. Just because you go to a journey group, but yet you don't do any of the other. I mean, does that make sense? He's not concerned with, oh, hey, well, I do one area really well and I stink at all of them, all the rest. No, he's going, no, I want you to do well with everything of a portion of your time, your talent, your resources, <laughs> all of it. Why? Because it's pretty serious to him. Matter of fact, so he says, take the talent from the one and give it to the one who has 10 talents for everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. But for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast that worthless servant. That's pretty harsh, right? Into darkness in the place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now he's speaking to Israel. <laughs> Praise God, he's speaking to Israel. <laughs> but the application can be said and true for his church. And so why do I give you that? Well, here's why. is because 
we believe that our church ought to be walking out the gospel with true generosity. And generosity doesn't just happen with money, although that's typically what we go towards, right? But it happens with your time, your talent. It's an investment in saying, I want to be shepherded. I want to be pastored. I want to to move forward in my faith. And we understand if you're not there, but we need you to prayerfully decide what it is that you want to do. Uh, So let me pray for us, everybody. Here we go. God, we love you and we thank you for today. We thank you for the blessing of being here. We pray, God, that you would use it to spur us on towards love and good deeds. In Jesus' name, amen.